gonna sing in Spanish the first time around, and so you know what we're saying. Uh, the song begins with "Stand Up," so letting you know uh, in advance, so you can take your effort, and uh, so please sing along. So, um, before we get back to the international in my language, English, um, there's, there's, sometimes we have people who really inspire us. Maybe they're people we know, people um, who sort of come into our lives in one way or another, or people we read about. One of mine, uh, and maybe some of yours too, is up here on the wall behind me. Um, Pete Seeger. Pete Seeger's birthday, that was done for his 90th birthday. Uh, we did a concert right here in the hall for him. Uh, he wasn't here. He was in Madison Square Garden on that day. But, uh, anyway, but he, uh, he actually said, to, he wrote to Mark Greenberg that he would, be, uh, he would have been feeling better singing in the old socialist labor hall than he would be in it. So he was one of the people that I've, I've admired and who inspired me over many years. Um, the other guy, I'm afraid, died just recently. And he was singing songs like, Down the way where the night's sick day, the sun shines daily on the mountain top. I took a trip on a sailing ship. When I reached Jamaica, I made a stop, but I'm sad to say I'm on my way. Won't be back for many a day. My heart is down, my head is turning around. 
He did that on a recording which he made in 1956. And in 1956, I was in a camp, Camp Willoway, and Pete Seeger came to visit us at the camp and sang for us. So I had a chance to listen to Harry Belafonte's Calypso music all summer long. And then also Pete Seeger came and inspired me as well. So both of those people. Now, Harry Belafonte, made a lot of money. He was a very, very famous, popular singer. There's a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, there's one percent, I guess, of people who make lots and lots of money. But they don't all spend it the way Harry Belafonte did. He uh, was a friend of Martin Luther King Jr. He paid for uh, bail for people who were jailed down south. He gave a lot of money to that cause and many other causes. He was just an incredible man. So often we hear about his, his Calypso songs, but he was much, much more than Calypso songs. So I, uh, I just wanted to recognize him here tonight because uh, he's a guy who should be missed and is missed. Arise. You well, this is always a kind of an ironic thing after we finish this great dinner for the first line of this thing to be arise you prisoners of starvation arise you wretched of the earth for justice thunders condemnation a better world in birth no more Traditions chains shall bind you. Arise, you slaves, no more enthroned. The earth shall rise on new foundations. We once were not, we shall be all. Tis the final conflict. Let each stand in their place. The international union will be the human race. Tis the final conflict. Let each stand in their place. The international union shall be the human race. Let's sing it now. If you can, some of you have some words on your table, maybe. Arise, you prisoners of starvation. Arise, you wretched of the earth. For justice thunders condemnation. A better world's in birth. No more. Traditions change shall bind you. Arise, ye slaves, no more enthroned. The earth shall rise on new foundations. We once were not, we shall be all. Tis the final conflict. Let each stand in their place. The end. International Union shall be the human race. Tis the final conflict. Let it stand in their place. The International Union shall be the human race. The National Union, it's going to be all of us, right? Shall be the human race. Thank you.
It's been a long time since we had Prima Maggio in the hall. We were doing it remotely for a few years with films, but we're really, really excited. And thank you all so much for being here and making this a celebration again. Um, I want to thank a few people. First and foremost, we need to thank Karen Lane. <laughs> to the members of the board. Um, I'm Ruth Rutenberg, I chair the board, but um, we have eight other board members that also work very, work very hard in the process. Mark Greenberg, who is just at the mic. Um, Tess Taylor is here tonight. Nick Siverett is here. Nick, you wanna just raise your hand? Um, Tess, raise your hand. Um, and Carolyn Shapiro, where's Carolyn? Carolyn, raise your hand too. Um, Carolyn's the one who resurrected Rise Up Bakery. Hey. Hey. The city of Barry is forever grateful for that. I mean, that's anyway. Um, so, most of you know the hall. I mean, this is a place where, for 120 years, social justice and economic justice, now a lot of focus on racial justice and environmental justice as well, have been the way of the way of this place. Um, and the likes of Eugene Victor Debs, Mother Jones, Big Bill Haywood, Emma Goldman. I mean, they all were people that were in Barry. I guess maybe Andrew's going to talk about that a little bit. Um, but this is the town that had more unions than any other town in Vermont. It was the only socialist labor hall built in the entire country. And the anarchists had their leaders here and their, and their newspapers. So um, Barry has a lot of history to be proud of. Paul Heller has written lots of books on, and stories about the history of Derry, and we owe a lot to you, Paul, for like keeping alive the um, a, a lot of that history. None of this scary Barry stuff, you know, and, and, and I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous that people don't honor and cherish the history of, of this town and of this hall. Yeah. Anyway, um, I wanted to just remind you about Rise Up Bakery, um, Wednesday um, through Friday, 1230 to 6, the window's open. You can call and make reservations for that. Um, thank you all for those of you who participated in the silent auction. Thank you to um, the Morrises for setting up the food hub, and that was a fundraiser that all went to the, you know, it's for the labor hall, so thank you guys for, for that. And um, thank you to Orca and Chris Wieser, Wieser, uh, um in the back who um, is taping this. Um, he also is doing a film um, that involves Barry and the labor hall, and it'll be coming out, for Chris, when? This summer. This summer. So, um, <laughs> the Vermont College of Fine Arts doesn't have an important place here, you know? I mean, we, we need to keep that in mind. Okay, so um, I just need to, um, a couple of announcements. I guess this one is a little late, but the bathrooms are in the basement. <laughs> the, the new lift is working and you can take it to the basement um, if you want. At the very end, um, any of you who are willing and able to help us with the chairs and tables, that would be great. Um, that, would, that would be wonderful. And then um, other things, um, we have lots of volunteers to thank. Pete Coleman, Carolyn Shapiro, Paula Emery, um, Anne Labruciano, Mary Skinner, um, Judy Rosenstrike, Ellen Sivrit, um, Maureen Morton. Yeah. We have um, donors from the auction, Bragg Farm, Justin Lane Briggs, Giuliano Cecinelli, Marianne Koch, Paul Heller, um, me as well, um, The Food Hub, and Carolyn Shapiro. Um, donors in terms of food and financial support, the Mutuo, the Italian American Heritage, Northfield Savings Bank, Campo de Vino, Mangy's Bakery, AR Market, Hannaford Market, Price Chopper Supermarket, Quality Market, and Shaw Supermarket. So that's all like a lot of people that come together and, and help us pull this off. 
Um, I also wanted to mention Hugo Casal Martinez, who did the beautiful Spanish mm -hmm. International. Um, he comes from a family of leaders of the Argentinian socialist movement. And he mysteriously, for years, left carnations on our front steps. Um, and we didn't know who it was, and it was him. And again, today, he left three carnations, I think for his grandparents and his mom, um, on, that, on, that front, on that front porch. So thank you, Hugo. Um, Almost at the end, I promise. Um, the, um, we have some special guests here. Um, our mayor, Jay Kemmerich, is here. Jay. <laughs> you want to say hello for her? Sure. Um. <laughs> well, a warm, a warm welcome to everybody here tonight. Uh, I'm the son of union workers, and, uh, and I'm a union worker myself, member of a union. And to think that this has had been happening for more than 100 years, wonderful people like you coming together uh, for a good cause, and good causes, is, uh, is a really special thing. So thank you for being here. One thing that I forgot to mention is that this has been a labor hall for a lot of years, um, and a lot of unions use it for meetings, but we also now have the United Steelworkers Local 4 and the Vermont American Federation of Teachers that are actually daily in the building, so it's truly a labor hall. And um, we're hoping, we're hoping um, as part of a group in Amsterdam to become a group of labor halls for the um, World Heritage um, sites, and um, that's under consideration, although it's a long way out. Okay, so before the speaker, we have one other guest that we need to recognize. Um, yeah, George Barron. George, come on up. Um, George last year as part of his middle school in uh, as part of his school in Middlesex um, developed this brochure about the Socialist Labor Party Hall. Um, it's on your table. Um, I think it's remarkable. We just want to thank you, and we have a, a small. Yeah, Karen. Okay, so there's a signed copy of Bread and Roses 2 from Catherine Patterson, and there's um, a, a old Labor Hall, Socialist Labor Party Hall t shirt that you hopefully you'll wear with pride. The talk that we're about to hear, um, the Cronica Locale, anarchists as community builders and champions of the workers of Barrie, um, is something that we're really very excited about. It may be exactly the reason why many of you came to, to the hall. And um, Andrew Hoyt, who's going to give that talk, um, has flown in from California. I think he's been two hours sleeping on the Seattle airport floor last night. So, I mean, you know, he's had a hard time coming in. But anyway, um, he received his doctorate in history in 2018 from the University of Minnesota, where he conducted research um, on the Italian immigrants um, and their social networks in the early 20th century newspapers as a fellow of the Immigration History Research Center. His dissertation was called, and they called them Galianti, Galianista, um, the rise of the Canaca. Kronika, sorry, Sobersiva, and the formation of America's most infamous anarchist faction, 1895 to 1912. 
It was a finalist for the annual Labor History Dissertation Award, and Andrew is currently employed by the California Community College Rising Scholars Program, where he teaches um, incarcerated students in the California prison system. Um, a little bit. A little bit about, about um, the abstract of his dissertation. It was based on his exhaustive reading of the Italian-American anarchist press, including the accounting of financial records um, printed in the chronic of um, Sorosiva. Um, Dr. Hart's Primo de Maggio talk is going to be focused on grassroots organizing conducted by Italian anarchists in Vermont. The discussion will include examples of how anarchists recruited immigrant stone carvers to their black flag, the influence anarchists um, exerted on local politics, the interpersonal relationships among the immigrant community, and the role um, Italian anarchists played in the larger social world of Vermont, including anarchist picnics, theater, and festivals in Barrie, and why Galliani and the publishers of the famous newspaper eventually left Vermont in 1912. It's with great pleasure that I um, bring Andrew Hoyt. Where are you, Andrew? Hey. Make sure I speak into this so I don't get yelled at. Um, <laughs> wow, what an honor to be here. Um, this storied Libra Hall, um, which I've spent a large portion of my life uh, learning about Barry, and to be here and to get to talk to all of you who know the town much better than me is um, really an honor and a pleasure. So I wanted to thank you for that. Um, also, I'm a, a, a member of a board of a history center and museum in California where I live, in Coulterville, California. So I know how much work goes into um, making an operation like this, although we're much more humble in many ways, but um, and more uh, gold rush era focused. So actually, this, this photo of me is in front of our, um, our museum in, in California, with, and I was uh, docenting the gold rush museum, hence the, the outfit. But, um, but I wore my Vermont wool to, to, to honor you all. <laughs> so um, this little bit of my background, I, I um, was doing a, a master's program in California in, in cultural studies and uh, with a focus on archives. And there was a professor at Pitzer College who had received a large shipment of Italian language anarchist material from a, um, the Giuseppe Pinelli archive in Milano. And he asked me to process it for him and, and put it into finding, make a finding aid, put it into acid-free folders and boxes and, and organize it all. And so for a summer, I got to have this collection in my one room studio apartment, a whole wall of this Italian language radical material. And I didn't really know much about Italian anarchism before this point. Um, I kind of knew about the modern anarchist movement. I cut my teeth in the anti-global movement uh, post-Seattle. Um, but I wanted to find out more so I started reading some uh, books. Uh, Paul Average, who was, uh, had, has come to Barry many years before, and I think kind of turned Paul Heller on to the, to the radical history of the town, uh, wrote the, the kind of a lot of the most important books in the movement, um, the big one being the Sacco and Vanzetti, The Anarchist Background, which is a, it's a key text to read, and really talks a lot about Galliani, who you see in the middle photo here, and the, and the Cronica Subversiva, which is the paper that was printed here. Um, from 1903 to 1912, and really had a, a massive impact um, in the world. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, then, uh, just a little bit how I ended up basically falling into a, a history PhD because of this collection that I, was, I got to process. And um, as, I was, as I was researching it, I was reading books about it. One book I came across is a book by Donna Gabaccia called The Italian Workers of the World. Oh, right? So I was like, oh, this is a good book. I'll get it from Amazon. Um, and uh, actually, it was recommended to me by Amazon, I think, because I got an, another book on, on uh, Italian anarchism. So the old recommendations, the, 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 lo the algorithms worked really well. And, um, and this, uh, Donna talks about the way that history um, being uh, trapped in the container of the nation, right? We call this methodological nationalism, blinds us to the story of immigrants and particularly radicals who have been forced into exile, right? So you have a, 
Italian history and you have American history and you have German history or what, but what about the, the Italians who came to America, right? How do you draw that connection? So um, first of all, I, I contacted her and told her how much I loved her, her work and how it influenced me and she ended up inviting me to come study under her in Minnesota um, and that's how I ended up getting a history PhD. Uh, and she had this huge influence on me, and she's um, kind of my intellectual mother. And um, can we get the next slide? Oh, I lost my slide, my slide presenter. OK, well, I'll keep talking. Um, anyway, so <laughs> for a second. Um, so yeah, so I got to go to the uh, study in the immigration archives in um, Minnesota. And, and when I had the collection in my, my house I was processing, I came across a pamphlet that was printed in, in uh, Barrie, Vermont in 1903. Uh, and I was like, what were Italian anarchists doing in Vermont in 1903? Like, it seems very um, random to me, right? And so I started kind of trying to research it. And uh, one of the things, and I'm going to try to include this in the lecture throughout, when you, when you start studying anarchism, you get a lot of the history of the big thinkers, right? Pietro Kopotkin and Mikhail Bakunin and um, and Emma Goldman, you know, the big orators. Galliani is one of the ones here we have on the far side here, Pietro Gori, who's kind of the original um, anarchist caricature of the mustachioed, uh, black, cape-wearing anarchist bomb thrower. Um, oh, thanks. Ah, now, you, now you can see me, too. Um, but, um, and, and I wanted to dig deeper, right? I wanted to get at. Uh, the uh, militant de basso, as the Italians would call them, the base militants, the, the, you know, the people who were giving out of their meager wages every week to support the movement. Um, and it's really hard to get at them. And, and part of the way you do it is through the newspapers, and that's what I'm going to be talking about, and that's what led me to really trying to uncover the story of what happened in Barrie um, now uh, 120 years ago. But um, the first thing I wanted to, there's a couple goals I have for this talk. And the first one is I wanted to make sure everyone kind of has a deeper understanding of what anarchism is. Um, and this is partially a gesture to, to Galliani, who um, I, I want to uh, honor and respect by giving a good, a fair accounting of, of his life, but also of, of the movement that, that shaped his life. Um, and there's a lot of myths, right, about anarchism. It's probably the most um, negatively connotated and described social movement, largely forgotten largely written out of the history books, um, social movement. And, and, and it was a critical piece of, of our history as, as, um, as Americans, as a transnational history of the late 19th and early 20th century of the labor movement. Um, you really can't understand how we developed what we call the left today without understanding the role that the anarchists played. They were um, a minority, but they were a very outspoken and, and active minority. And it might also seem kind of funny, but they were very organized. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but not in a, in a hierarchical way, right? Not in a vertical way. There was a horizontalism, right, um, that is, is critical. And so as I was studying, I started kind of looking at networks and thinking, we now talk about social media as such a, a basic thing in our lives, right? But um, the newspapers, and particularly of the anarchists, are kind of the paramount uh, pre-digital social media movement and network movement and diasporic movement. Um, and so they're really, really fascinating. And it's kind of classic uh, cartoon kind of, you have the picture of the anarchists, you know, or the, the bomb throwers, the nihilists, right? Um, the, uh, uh, you know, now a lot of people might think of the anarchists as kind of punk rock, dropout, you know, um, screw society, burn it all down. But that's not really what the, the movement was historically. Uh, it actually, much more was families raising kids and trying to build communities. And, um, and you know, we can remember these kind of spectacular moments of violence, the, the Haymarket bombing or uh, the, the bomb on Wall Street or the assassinations uh, I'll talk about. But um, they were really a small part, a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of, the, of anarchists who, who did these propaganda of the deed actions. And, um, and, it, and it's certainly a tiny part of the activity that went into building the movement. And most of the activity that went into building the movement was, was building communities. It was having these kind of um, dinners that we're having tonight. So that's where I really want to bring us back to. Can I get the next slide? So to, to really take it back and give you context, I want to take you back to 
uh, Napoleon's invasion of Italy. Right? So we're going back to, to the beginning of the 19th uh, century. All right? um, Italy had been uh, an incredibly fractured and colonized peninsula. Right? The Austro-Hungarians largely controlled it. Um, Metternich, the, the, the kind of head of the Austro-Hungarian government, uh, referred to Italy as um, a geographical expression. <laughs> right? It wasn't a place. It wasn't a nation. It certainly wasn't a people. Right? They didn't share language. Uh, they, they were fractured and, and scattered, as you can see all of the, the, in the middle map here. But when, when uh, Napoleon invaded, he unified the, the peninsula and, and um, kind of seeded the idea of a unified Italy as a, as a nation. And this is the beginning of, of struggles to, to build nations that are, are representative of self-determination of a people. So you have here in the picture in the middle there is, is Mazzini. Uh, Mazzini is considered the, the father of um, the modern European map, the, the, the post-World War I Europe, right? the post-imperial Europe. This idea of, of a people having a, of a government that represents them. Um, and he started a, a series of, of political uh, radical groups, started off with Cabaneri, but he goes, there's young Italy, then there's young Europe, there's young Poland, there's young Argentina, there's uh, young Turkey, there's all these groups that are connected to Mazzini. They're fighting against um, the imperial powers of the, of the, of the day, of uh, Austro-Hungarians, of the Ottomans, um, et cetera. And so after, um, after Napoleon is defeated, right, and after 1915, they have a Congress of Vienna, and the old powers come in and replace the old map onto Europe, right, and, and, and reassert all of the, the old power system. And, but left behind is, is this uh, republicanism. Right? And out of the republicanism in Italy comes the risorgimento movement, right? the resurgence, this idea of sort of fight to unify Italy into one country. And by 1860s, they finally succeed and, and unify Italy. Um, and it's really finished by 1870. But, um, and that was under Garibaldi and these really fabulous leaders. If you ever want to really get some great um, history, uh, you should really read about Garibaldi's invasion of Sicily and, and the red shirts and the whole story. But, um, there's this movement to unify Italy, uh, this ext uh, extended over many, many decades um, through 1848 revolutions, uh, et cetera, and it finally succeeds in the 1860s. But part of what happens is it ends up not becoming the republic that they had hoped for. It becomes a, a monarchy in the, in the process of unification. The kings of Piedmont uh, take over and, um, and, and run the country. And about 2% of the population is allowed to be involved in the government. In other words, we call it a, a, a constitutional monarchy, right? Um, and it, but you have to have property rights to vote or be involved. And, and part of the, the process is also a massive exploitation of the southern half of the peninsula, which impoverishes uh, Naples and Sicily under these large land-owning old um, kind of absentee landlord systems. And um, there's massive suffering, there's huge recruitment into a, into a uh, conscripted military to suppress rebels in the south who were fighting against this colonization from the north. Um, and there's a lot of discontent. And that's really going to seed the beginning of a critique both of, um, the, of nation building projects right, and of nationalism and of the bourgeoisie uh, republicanism. Yeah, next slide. So coming out of the Risorgimento and the kind of the failure of the Risorgimento to benefit the average people or to create a, a representational government, you get um, two major movements, right? You have uh, the, the International Working Men's Association, and, um, which is formed, and you also have the, the Paris Commune. And, and Mazzini, while he was a radical, anti-colonial um, thinker, was also very, very religious, and um, he was opposed to the Paris Commune, which made him kind of lose support of a lot of the people who had been on what we'd call the Italian left. And um, at the same time, the, the early Italian state had been constructed in opposition to the papal states, right? They literally unified it. They had to take the land away from the papacy. And to be involved with the Italian government in the 19th century, you would be excommunicated from the Catholic Church um, because it was considered an enemy to the, to the papacy, right? So the Italian left immediately was, was rapidly anti-Catholic, right? And Mazzini here was very, was, had his religiosity. So he kind of falls out of the scene. And, and the Paris Commune, which we have pictures here, 
Um, and these are, all the engravings are, are coming from the Corona Conservativa. A lot of them are done by the local artist. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Carlo Abate. He ran the school. So you can see here the CA of Barry signatures. Um, you see this is the CA symbol on a lot of his artwork. This is the Paris Commune. The Paris Commune, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, it was this critical moment in the history of the left. After the Prussian Wars, when the Germans had invaded France and, and the, the, the French government fled Paris out to the Palace of Versailles and left the Parisians to defend themselves, and they successfully defended themselves um, and, and went through starvation and, and deprivation. And, um, and then uh, after the French government signed a treaty with the Germans, the Parisians said, screw you, we don't want you coming back, we can run, our, run ourselves. And they created the Commune of Paris. Eventually, the French government um, comes in with the military and massacres thousands and thousands of the communards and sends the rest into exile. Um, and this is the wall where they were executing them in the um, Pierre Cliché Cemetery. Can I get the next slide? So at the same time as you're having this kind of collapse of, of republicanism in Italy, you're having um, the failure of a belief in the, in the bourgeois republic being able to improve the lives of the people. You also have, in the, starting in the you know, 1860s, 1870s, moving forward, um, industrialization. Right? And the great failure of industrialization and modernization was that while everything was being produced more and faster and bigger, the average lives of the average people were brutally um, worse. So this created what they called the social question. Right? How do we fix the social, how do we have to deal with child labor? How do we deal with mass starvation? How do we deal with maimed bodies who can no longer work and are starving on the streets, right? And out of the social question comes the socialists, right? And there's three basic branches of socialism. Oh, first I'm gonna, at the same time, so this is in 1893, um, you have a, uh, a series of revolts that are re reacting to the, um, economic destabilization in Italy, you have the Siciliani Fasci. Now, um, this is where the fascists take their name in the 1920s under Mussolini, but the original Fasci in Sicily was workers' collectives are organizing against exploitation, and they were massively oppressed. And in one of the most kind of politically uh, progressive parts of Italy, in Ljubljana, and particularly a town named Carrara, uh, there was an uprising in solidarity with what was happening in Sicily and then massive oppression. And Carrara is this uh, amazing marble carving region of Italy. It's where the marble that created the, the famous David statue comes from. Right? It's, if you go to, to northern Italy, to northern Tuscany, to Carrara, you see these mountains and it looks like they're snow-capped. Um, but it's not snow, it's marble. Right? Um, and it's an incredibly beautiful place. I gave a talk in a hall very similar to this in Carrara um, about Barry which was a fabulous experience. <laughs> um, and, and I had a, 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 one of the guys from Carrara stand up and start singing a song in Italian about Barry um, and how you shouldn't go there because that's where you die um, uh, because of the silicosis that was, was um, experienced by the workers, which we're going to talk about a little bit more. But can we get the next? So, um, so the, the socialist movement that's developing in the late 19th century um, ends up fracturing through the, the uh, politics of the first international into three basic strands, right? You have what we call the authoritarian communists, right, which become, are, are, the, are the Marxists who really end up growing into the Bolsheviks and the Mintonik and the kind of what we consider communists today. You have the, what they call the reformist socialists or the state socialists which are the socialist labor party type groups that are looking at creating a political party. They will try to win elections and influence politics to improve the lives of the workers through the, the political apparatus. And then you have the dreaded and much maligned anarchists, who also were known mostly at the time period under the title of libertarian socialists. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. Uh, a, a lot of people in America are scratching their head, libertarian socialist? Um, <laughs> Because we have this idea of libertarians, right, as, as being like radical capitalists, right? People who want to remove government fetters on, on free market and suddenly everything will be great. Um, but, and, and they're a political party, which is kind of confusing. But um, <laughs> the anarchists uh, explicitly rejected political solutions to social problems. 
They did not believe that you could use a political apparatus to solve the economic situation, that the fight had to be on the shop floor, right? Um, that that you, had to, you had to have a social solution. It had to be cultural solution. It had to be, we had to contract new relationships with each other to change things. It wasn't something that you could, you could vote in, right? And indeed, they were critical um, often also of the labor movement, feeling that often unions became self-perpetuating organizations. They were only interested in small uh, labor increases. They would be raised by inflation. Um, and they needed instead to be focusing on seizing the means of production themselves, not just having a, a, a smaller slice of the pie. Um, so here we have also a, a, the, um, a, one of the early mastheads of the Kronika which is um, an image, I don't know if any of you know what November uh, 1887 was significant for? Anyone? This is Chicago, the Haymarket. So these are the Haymarket martyrs on the cover, of, on, the, on the head of the Kronika, right? Uh, the anarchists of Chicago. Um, and then we got uh, Bakunin and Marx, who are both, these are both, once again, woodblock engravings from the, from the Kronika. Can you get the next slide? So um, going into the 1890s, the, the anarchists enter a period called uh, the period of propaganda of the deed. This is kind of what gives the, um, the, the anarchists their most explosive connotations. Right? Um, they are involved with the, the most number of assassinations of political leaders um, throughout the world uh, in world history. Right? But these were not, um, for the anarchists understood it, not as, as a terrorism, not trying to influence politics by scaring the masses, um, but as atentate, right? Tit for tat, right? You, you, you shoot the workers, we're going to kill you, right? So um, these, these are all figures who are uh, these uh, atentate, the uh, propaganda of the deed guys, right? And, and the top here is Bresci. Bresci is one of the most important Italian-American anarchists. Bresci was a member of the Right to Existence group in Patterson, New Jersey, where they published um, some of the most important uh, uh, radical papers of the time. And um, in, um, there is a, the Fata de Maggio that happened in Milan when there were bread riots because uh, uh, people were starving. And uh, a general there gave an order to open up on the crowd with uh, military weapons and kill maybe up to 1,000 of the protesters, and then the, the king of Italy gave this general um, a medal of honor for defending the republic. And so Bresci left Patterson, traveled to Italy, bought a gun, walked up and killed the king. Um, and this is a picture of him killing him uh, by, um, by Abate and on, his, uh, on the stand defending himself. The attentators are very interesting. They didn't run from their crimes. Uh, they wanted to be arrested so they could speak their truth at the trials and, and face uh, the punishment that came with it. They would often um, write letters, uh, for instance, saying, I'm so sorry that, um, to the wife of the, of the man that they, uh, they killed, I'm so sorry I killed your husband. I was not aiming at him. I was only aiming at the king. Um, right? Um, so they were trying to make it a costly for the domination of the working class. Okay, good. So uh, just to kind of um, increase this idea, the anarchists were not uh, a holistic group. The Italians have a saying, you get uh, uh, three anarchists in the room and you have five positions. <laughs> right? So they, they rapidly had a diversity of, of ideas. You know, the Spanish were very known for anarcho-collectivism. Um, they developed anarcho-communism, which was kind of expanding the idea of, of, of to each according to their needs, from each according to their ability. Um, and then eventually developed the idea of anarcho-syndicalism which would be uh, going into the, the unions, building horizontal unions, such as they built in Spain, the, and the CNT, the Confederation Nacional de Bajos, which was the, the union that fought against the fascists in the 1930s in the Civil War, um, and believed that unions could be kind of the, the body of organization that would allow for a continued organizing of society, a functioning of society uh, without the hierarchy. So the question here was not about, really about, um, what we could consider organization. It wasn't about chaos, right? It wasn't dystrophy, right? It was about trying to develop a way to organize without hierarchy. Anarchism is no leaders, right? Not no thinking. Um, and, and there is a lot of tension 
so, so uh, the anarchists who, who come to Barry end up being on the anarcho-communist side, and they end up being very critical of the unions. Um, but that also comes out largely out of an experience of working class organizers seeing unions fail the working class. Um, also, this is a kind of classic XY axis that you see kind of used to map different political ideologies. We often talk about left and right wing in America, going back to the French Revolution again, right? Um, and it's a kind of a simplistic way of thinking about politics. And often you hear people, oh, if you go far enough left, you end up on the right, right? Um, or something like this. This kind of helps break that down. So here you have left and right, which is really about property. It's about community versus private property. And you have authoritarianism versus uh, freedom, libertarianism, right? Um, and if you plot out different political groups on there, you can get kind of more diversity. Uh, in general, you know, if you have full private property rights and full authoritarianism, in the top right corner, you get fascism, right? If you have full community rights, but full authoritarianism, that's when you get communism, right? If you have full freedom, but full pro private property rights, that's where you get like American libertarianism, right? And if you have a full push towards full freedom and full community rights, that's where the anarchists are at. This is one of the reasons the anarchists say that it's demanding the impossible, right? Because there's a tension inherent between individual freedom and community rights. And, and they're trying to push the maximum envelope to get the maximum of both of those things. And then within the anarchist circle, you get these different groups. Anarchist, communists, the collectivists, the syndicalists, the mutualists, et cetera. Can you go to the next slide. So this brings us to Galliani. Galliani comes out of this post-Risorgimento generation. The, um, for instance, the, the major uh, military mind and inspiring leader of the Risorgimento was, was this guy Garibaldi. Garibaldi was considered the great military thinker of the 19th century. Um, Abraham Lincoln asked him to uh, lead the Union Army in the Civil War you know, at the beginning of the war, right? Before it was really a radical war, when it was just to preserve the Union. And Garibaldi's response was, yes, but only if we agree this is to end slavery, and not only in America, but afterwards we go on to Brazil. And Lincoln was like, oh, yeah, no, never mind. <laughs> um, but it's often interesting to think about. If you know anything about the American Civil War, you know that they had, the Union had really shitty generals for most of it. Um, and it was one of those, if he had taken Garibaldi, it might have ended really quick and, and very differently. But, um, but he didn't. But Galliani, Garibaldi's last big uh, battle was his Battle of Mintana. Uh, where he lost, there was the one battle that he lost as an old man, and this is how kind of the king ends up taking over the, the revolution. And, um, and Galliani, one of his pen names is Mintana. So he very directly refers himself back to the kind of far left of the Risorgimento. Um, and as a young man, he first started studying to be a lawyer in Piedmont, and he decided, um, this isn't for me, I'm gonna do, write a radical newspaper. He started publishing a radical newspaper, uh, got persecuted by the Italian state and, and fled to France where he really ran into the, the, the Parisian working class radical Milieu that radicalized him. He worked with um, Elisée Reclus, you have on the bottom here, who was one of the communards. It was a, a guy who helped lead the Paris commune, ran the um, art and cultural uh, kind of wing of, the, of, of protecting the museums in Paris during the, the commune. Uh, Reclus was, was a fascinating character. He was a, um, a vegetarian. He was a, a militant pacifist. Um, and when the French army declared that any Parisians caught with a gun would be killed on sight for defending Paris against the government, uh, he marched out onto the barricades holding a gun upside down so that, it, that if, if he got caught, he'd be killed along with everybody else. Um, and so on the, on the far side here, you have a, one of the, uh, another uh, engraving from the Kronika called the, the Reign of Silence in Italy, about the persecution of the left in Italy. Now, in, the, in Italy, the left refers to them, themselves as sovversivi, subversives. For a very long time, they would get arrested and, and tried as malfattori, as malfactors, as criminals. Right? In fact, one of the great Italian anarchists, Enrico Malatesta, was one of the first people to successfully get himself tried as a subversive, as a political criminal, not as an as a, as a, um, economic criminal, right? Um, but they're, they're brutally oppressed. And so he fled to France. He ends up in Switzerland working with Reclus, where Reclus was writing the University Geographia Encyclopedia, 
There's like a 20 some volume collection of, of book of texts. It's considered now one of the most important radical uh, geographical um, texts. Um, and eventually he gets uh, he backs it back out of, out of France. He gets arrested. He's part of what they call the, um, the trial of the 30 of these terrible laws or anti-anarchist laws that are passed in France. And, um, and then he is sent back to Italy where the Italian state sends him in domicilio coatto. And this is kind of um, hard to translate. Sometimes uh, uh, internal exile um, or a forced habitation. But basically, they would send a huge number of, of prisoners to these desert islands in the middle of the Mediterranean, um, uh, where they would be kept uh, on the, you know, little shacks and, and just isolated. Um, Galliani was you know, a pretty good looking young guy and he was an incredibly brilliant orator. He's considered probably the top Italian uh, orator of his generation. The, you know, um, we have lots of um, testament to say, you know, if you heard Galliani speak, you wanted to go shoot the first cop you saw. Um, you know, even people who were not really supporters of it, they say, oh, anytime Galliani came to town, I was there to hear him talk. And I'll talk about a little bit about, about his oratory and his language and what he did. But um, he, he was on the island, imprisoned. He ends up um, escaping from the island with the help of the warden's wife, um, who escapes with him, with their kids, and lives the rest of his li her life with him as, as a partner. Um, and, they, and they escape to North Africa, uh, for, uh, I believe to Tunisia. Then he go end up in Alexandria, Egypt, where he starts an anarchist free school. Um, eventually he goes to London. And, and then Malatesta requests that he come um, and help run the paper in, um, New, in Patterson, New Jersey. So he comes to help publish the Question Sociale. Now, the Question Sociale was being published by the Right to Existence Group in Patterson. This is um, the Silk Weavers. Right, the Silk Dyers, the um, in Patterson, huge, <laughs> huge, huge Italian population. This is the, the the front of their offices. Here they are, a bunch of the editors in in the office, and a bunch of the of the silk workers. Um, earlier, the paper had had a. There was another fight that happened within the Italian anarchist movement between what they called the organizzatori and the anti-organizzatori, or the organizationalists and the anti-organizationalists. Um, it's really, I think, better for us to think about it as institutionalists because we understand horizontal organizing is a form of organizing. Um, but back then, it was, it was people who wanted to form like an anarchist union or an anarchist party, uh, which was Malatesta and others, and people who said, you know, you can't do that. Anarchists should only gather in temporary groups for particular functions um, and then break apart because the group will become this kind of a stagnant thing over time. Um, but the, the at this time, Galliani was, was in the camp with Malatesta. And they, uh, the, the group in Patterson got rid of an anti-organizational uh, editor. And uh, for a while, Malatesta was there. And then they brought in Galliani to be the new editor of the paper. And he comes in in um, 1902 and uh, helps lead the strike in Patterson. And um, the strike basically fails because of a lack of solidarity in the working class. The uh, silk dyers' helpers, the, or the lower paid, uh, less skilled workers, are on strike. And a bunch of the silk weavers and other um, more highly paid and highly skilled workers uh, refuse to support them. Uh, and, and it's clear to Galliani that the strike is going to fail. And so they end up taking um, a really militant action. They um, have a big rally in a park and uh, start having speakers, and then immediately turn and march at the factories and ended up smashing all the factories that had scabs working at them, doing a huge amount of property damage. And the uh, National Guard is called in, and arrest warrants are put out for the leaders. Galliani escapes, and he um, ends up going to Montreal. Can I get the next slide? And in Montreal, he gets a message from a bunch of anarchists in Barrie, who are like, hey, why don't you come here and start a paper? Um, so he ends up coming to Barrie uh, 120 years ago. Uh, to, to start a paper. Um, Barry at the time, I don't need to tell you too much of this history because you're all, all familiar, but for, for the uh, video audience, Barry is, the, is this uh, mecca of, of granite carving and, and quarry work. Uh, 10,000 uh, quarry workers at least were, were uh, employed in Barry, mostly immigrants. There was an earlier generation of Scottish immigrants, and then the Italians, particularly from Carrara and from some other regions in Italy, started coming over to work in the quarries. And he's, those Carrara guys who had been part of that insurrection 
in solidarity with the fasci in Sicily, um, had brought their whole political culture with them. They brought their, their mutual aid societies with them. They brought their, their, their kind of political tradition, right? So the first radical group that I uncovered was the Club degli Operai de Lingua Italiana de Berri e Vicenza, right? The, the, um, the Club of uh, Workers of the Italian Language in Berry and the region. And, um, and the founders of this group, these are their surnames. Um, and I, was, I put those in there just because maybe some of you might recognize some of them. Um, and side note, a historian's dream is someone to walk up and say, hey, I've got my great grandfather's diary. So if any of you <laughs> have a diary, please let me know. Um, and uh, I'm not going to read this to you, but you can look at it while I'm talking. But um, actually, and uh, so they, they start off with this club, um, and the club radically starts turning lefty, right? It starts, they, there's an, uh, hey, should we put the Italian flag up? And they're like, no. Um, <laughs> and instead, we're going to raise money to support Louisa Michelle, one of the communards. We're gonna, so they start making these gestures towards you know, the, the, this clear political identity that, that they had already. And eventually, they found a, a paper to be the, their organ, right? Now, the newspapers were, were much more than a paper bringing you the news, right? There are journals, which are like, you know, publications, regular publications, periodicals. But um, they really functioned, and this is my, like, kind of one of my major thesis of my dissertation, which I would love for you all to read, um, <laughs> but is that, that the newspaper was a multi-directional social media platform. It allowed for communication across the diaspora in, in ways that would not have been possible otherwise. So you could send in little notes to the paper, um, you know, addressed to someone else you knew who was reading the paper, your cousin or a friend of yours. You might be somewhere, you might be in Argentina and you're trying to reach somebody who is working in West Virginia in the coal mines. And if you're reading the newspaper, you'd get that note. You also had a constant dialogue with the, with the, the editors um, and the publishers. You had people writing in their um, own responses. You had correspondence uh, compared to most mainstream capitalist papers of the day, their ability to have correspondence of the, in the Italian anarchist press was just exceptional, because the Italians were really the diasporic population of the era. They were scattered all over the place. Because in Italy, you had this massive oppression and economic injustice. Massive uh, starvation and hunger and lack of work, unemployment, uh, and so people left, right? They came to the United States and they, came, and they went to Argentina, were the two major destinations, but they, and France, all of Switzerland, um, Portugal, all over the place. And one of the things you see in the Kronika is it's really connected to the um, hard rock miners and coal miners um, all over the country. But, um, so yeah, they decided to print a paper. One of the interesting things is that, um, can I get the next slide? The, the paper is, um, and this is from the, the first edition of the paper, some of their, um, their kind of description of what the paper was for. So the Kronika in our historical imagination um, is, is remembered as this, like, the most partisan of the anti-organizationalist papers. They you know, advocated uh, propaganda of the deed. They, uh, they printed and sold uh, bomb-making manuals. They advocated for assassination of, of political leaders. Um, but when it starts off, it's not that. So my goal was to try to understand how the Kronika became the Kronika that we remember and how Galliani became the Galliani we know him as, right? Because he started off leading a, a union strike in, in Patterson. He started off being on the side of, uh, of Maltesta and the organizationalists. So how did he become the firebrand that attacked the, the socialists and the anti-organizationalists and the, you know, sorry, the organizationalists and the union? Um, so this is just kind of give you a sense that they were conceived as an organ of a, of a particular set of individuals, groups, churches, or academies. Rather, they long to be loyal voices of the truth, the fair voice of the proletariat, working and suffering and pain, without tears and without resignation, hardened by the great resurgence of arms, of spirit, and of weapon. There is these hard-living workers in anarchy and the social revolution that paper is fraternally addressed, by the Tricolo di Studi Sociali di Berry. So that original group, that club, had evolved into this uh, social studies circle, which is a, a typical name for the anarchist Groups, right? Can I get the next slide? So in Barry, the social studies circle starts the newspaper, but they do a lot of other things. And there's a section in the paper called the Chronicle Locale, 
like local news, right? And uh, the Chronicle of the Halley, it constantly lists all the events that have gone and buried. So I went through and harvested, I think, over, over 700 um, notes of what was going on in Barry. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the details. I would love to share them all with you, but you, you would uh, get tired. But, um, but I'm saying you can read the, you can read the uh, dissertation and hopefully a book someday. But, um, but here you get a sense of the, of the um, weekly schedule that they would have, right? So, you know, on, on Sundays you would have your uh, reunions, your picnics. They loved having picnics on Sundays when all of the Protestants were going to church. And they would go and they would shoot guns and, um, and have races and drink alcohol. This is the time in Barry, like Vermont is very dry, right? So this did not um, engender them a lot to the, to the kind of the Protestant uh, elite in town. Um, they also love to have their, their theater performances, you can see, and fest day or parties, dinner parties like this that they would often have silent auctions or other things that raise money for all kinds of various uh, social struggles. It could be to raise money for the widow of someone who died in a coal mine accident. It could be to support a union uh, strike. Um, and it could be to um, send money to help the, the uh, oppressed workers in Russia or in Spain. Um, but they're constantly having parties every week. And all those parties are tied into political purposes. In this way, you would bring the average non-political immigrant worker, right, who just come to town, you know, young guy, most of them, uh, and you'd bring them to the, there's a party, there's food, there's drink, there's, you know, good times, and then they, they got associated with a political thing, right, on Saturday night, you have the big party, and oh, this is to raise money to support the strike going on in the cigar rollers in Florida, and oh, by the way, we're having a meeting tomorrow on Sunday if you want to come to the meeting, right, so they start, and they're really competing with the church, the Catholic church and the Protestant churches. They're competing with the union and they're competing with the socialist labor hall for the allegiance of, the, of these young workers. Um, and one of the major ways they do that is providing the community with concrete services, right? And this is something that, you know, um, a lot of uh, radicals maybe have lost sight of in some ways in America. And I think there's a lesson to begin that they built a movement because they did things that really improved the life of the average immigrant. Um, and then also politicized them at the same time. Here's a, uh, um, over the year, you can see how the different events changed. The major thing you get out of this is that uh, they had picnics in the summertime. I guess, I guess picnics in the wintertime in Vermont aren't really popular. Um, I'm from California, so I don't know. It's green um, in the wintertime. But, um, and, yeah, and then so they would have the indoor parties. They had raffles. Uh, and then the theater performances, they were, often, were at the opera house in town. Um, I've done uh, financial calculations. They report in the paper everything. Every, during every party, they report how much they spent on a keg of beer, how much they paid the band, how much money came in, how much, where that money went, right? Um, they, they tell you, you know, we had a, a theater thing and we brought in this much money, the tickets were sold for this much. So you can kind of figure out, well, how many people went to that event. They were often having uh, 500 people at their, at their theater performances. Um, other scholars have done work similar to this in New York City, find that the New York City anarchists had the same number of people showing up at the theater conference, right? So, I mean, the, the scene here is really vibrant. And, there, and things like theater, you've you got to remember, 1903, there's no TV, there's no radio, right? This is the thing that, th this was entertainment for the community. Um, also, uh, the theater is really fascinating um, in terms of gender. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, here we go, next slide. So yeah, anarchist parties. Like I was saying, they're raising money for all kinds of events. Uh, the um, mem remembrance of the Paris Commune was a huge one that they had huge parties and gatherings for. Um, here is one of these uh, raising money for some arrested uh, union guys in Little Fall, New York. I think this would be a great cover for a band also. <laughs> um, I mean, just look at the style. Um, Emma Goldman for the homestead. This is in, in Catalonia for uh, the suppression of the Spanish workers. So that they, they were, had this internationalism, right? They, they were always pushing against uh, being confined as just Italians, right? They didn't want to identify as Italians. They wanted to be workers of the world, right? And they would often have parties with the Spanish. There's reports of uh, the Catalonians coming and doing great dances at their parties, um, you know, and raising money for events going on in Spain or Russia, those are the two of the major ones. 
But um, there is always this attempt to, and, you, and you, you've got to think about it, that, you know, the inner group of the, of the Shirkolo might have been maybe 20 or 30 people, right? But they're, then they're having events with like 500 people at them, right? And, and, and they're bringing them in, they're politicizing them. They're also getting them the sense of being part of a larger uh, global struggle against capitalism um, and identifying and pushing against at the same time in which n nation is becoming the, the like, coherent way of organizing the world, right? In which nation states are becoming the dominant form of, of so societal identity. They're really pushing against that. They, don't, they, they want people to identify in something much bigger and much more universal. And this is why we say that anarchists are really the uh, inheritors of the universalist tradition of the Enlightenment, right? So then they also had the drawing school, which I think um, probably most of you are familiar with Carlo Abate. He was not only the artist, here's a, that CA on, his, on the engravings in the paper, um, but here he is teaching in the school in Barry. Um, there's a huge number of articles about the school in Barry, um, uh, mostly complaining that the that, that workers are not supporting it enough. They're trying to get the parents to be more involved with it, um, complaining that the fathers were not coming to the meetings, only the mothers are coming to the meetings. And, why are the dads not caring about the children's education? And, um, and really struggling. Eventually, they withdraw and stop supporting the school, and then Abate continues on. Um, and Carlo Abate is, is, is a, a really a fabulously interesting character. Um, he uh, came over from Milan, where he had um, studied and, and been given awards as, as an artist. Um, he taught the art. He did sculpture work. And then he and did the teaching of the, of the youth. He was also known for kind of being fearless, going into um, homes with tuberculosis and things, to taking care of orphans, uh, providing shoes and clothing to children. Um, so really, um, one of these linchpins that helped connect the anarchist transnational network to the local community. And so when we start talking about networks, right, we have to understand that it, it gets us out of the language of hierarchy. Right? So when you talk about like social movements, there's leaders, and then there's people following them. Right? And there's a, the great orators, the writers, like Galliani, and then there's like kind of a mass of people who are like, you know, under their sway. But when you, when you talk, have network theory, you start understanding that you, know, you can have a, um, a network element like Galliani, that we call it a creative element, that, um, that has a huge amount of, of connections running through them. But you also have bridging nodes. And bridging those are people who link together different, what would otherwise be very distantly connected parts of a network. So Abate is kind of the great example of a bridging node. But he's deeply embedded in the average community, right? But he's also extremely connected to the, the he's the major artist for this uh, transnational anarchist newspaper, right? And so there he gets to kind of embody anarchist values to the average people. And the, the anarchists always are positioning themselves as being like the true champion of the working class and of the immigrant workers. Yeah. And then there was the anarchist theater, um, which you're all familiar with the opera house here in town. Uh, it's famous because Emma Goldman and Galliani spoke there during the, the liquor fights that I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, it, I would say the other really interesting thing is the, the articles about the theater are the place where the most number of women's names appear. So, you don't hear a lot about the women in terms of organizing the, the events, although you kind of know that they were the ones probably cooking all the food. Thank you also for the lovely dinner tonight. Um, and it gender manifests itself. Um, but the, the, in the theater, is women really got their names in the paper and were made much more of a clear presence. And it was really a critical way of raising money for the movement um, and educating the population. So there's a lot of interesting discussions about what plays were good for an anarchist theater troupe to perform and what weren't? What was a, a frivolous bourgeois you know, romance play? And what was a play that had like, a good working class educational you know, lesson to be taught, where there was a, you know, some corrupt industrial boss who was you know, poisoning the, the workers and you know, uh, you know, killing the, you know, the, the whistleblowers, and they needed to you know, have people organize against them. So they, um, and they really pushed for these plays. And they weren't always the most popular. Like the bourgeois romances you know, usually uh, sold more tickets. But, <laughs> but that wasn't the point, right? The point was not just to provide um, education. It wasn't just to have a party or to a theater. It was to, to engage with propaganda. And in, in our sense, kind of post-Cold War sense, propaganda has a really dirty connotation. 
right? But in, in this time period, propaganda was propagating your ideas. It was, it was just planting seeds. It was spreading the idea, right? And so the anarchists had the propaganda of the deed tradition, which was, was spreading the idea of revolt through the things you did, and propaganda of the word, right? And that was the newspapers, that was the plays, that was the art, that was the poetry, that was the songs. Um, I wanted to say also, like, having the international song here was just so amazing and touching to me. Um, I've been at gatherings in Italy of um, radicals where they just sing songs like that all night. And I've always felt so um, impoverished as an American. We don't, we don't have that kind of tradition. Unless we pull on, like, Pete Seeger, you know, pull up Rise Up Singing songbook. Um, you know, there, there is that tradition, but it's largely been lost. We have, like, you know, mostly corporate songs that we can all sing, Beatles songs we can sing together, Dylan songs, um, which are great. But there's, there's an older tradition of songs that are really amazing um, in the movement. And so the other side, the, the, the anarchists are in the critical locality, they're constantly uh, publishing report backs from the announcements for parties, report backs from the parties, the finances, and the most bucolic and beautiful language. Oh, the festivities were grand, and the flowers were everywhere for the Prima de Maggio, like lots of Prima de Maggio parties that they had. Uh, everyone had a good time. Here's the money everyone donated. You know. And then on the other side of it, like the next entry in the Chronicle Locale will be like this blistering attack upon different people in, in Barry who the anarchists hated. So here are the groups that the anarchists hated um, and the number of mentions. And, um, you know, and when it, you know, uh, to be fair, they did not like the socialist labor hall. Um, one of the anarchists was killed in the labor hall uh, when they were trying to, Sorati, who was a socialist um, newspaper man, had uh, published Galliani's presence here. Remember, he is running from the cops when he came to Barry, and he was printing under the pen name Mintana. He also used the name Ilbeck, or was like the old man. Um, but uh, yeah, Sorati publishes in the socialist paper that Galliani's in Barry. And he came here to speak in the socialist labor hall, and the anarchists all tried to deplatform him, calling him a rat. Um, and there was a big fight, and, and, and Corti was shot, right? Um, there, there, is, um, there was a lot of tension. There, uh, also, like the, there's interesting critiques of the co-op bakery, um, which uh, particularly after it failed uh, and lost the workers a lot of money, and they were, and the anarchists were critical of this, like kind of being callous with the with the donation from the workers, um, and and the socialists not like really protecting the workers enough. Um, uh, really, a lot of attacks on the union, on the stonecutters union, um, the granite carvers union. They uh, for um, they they for instance, the union tried to pass a law that all speaking at union meetings had to be in English. Right. They. Um, there was a lot of old boy networks. There was a guy who was like the, uh, uh, I think in charge of roads or something, a, a city government position, um, but was also like working like one hour a month so he could con continue collecting his union, you know, retirement money. Um, there was lots of these kind of, it, a lot of their time was spent critiquing the, the established power system in Barrie um, and how it was exploiting the, the working class. Um, the priests get attacked a lot. You know, the police, one of the major ones there, they're talking a lot of trash on the cops. Um, the socialists are the major ones that they're attacking. Um, other subversives, the temperance. They didn't like, so you have the, the liquor fight starts happening, and, and they're in an interesting position there. Can I get the next slide? So yeah, this combative language. So when they start critiquing it, Galliani's language is insane. Like, he's. <laughs> He is very, he is like one, pe one period per paragraph, run on sentences of extremely poetic language of, um, you know, I mean, I, th this is a very slight sampling, uh, referring to people as pimps of Mistopheles, bandits, whores deserving a good fuck, pirates, mercenaries, mobsters, above the law, big shots, systematic scammers, hypocrites, charlatans, thieves, criminals, blackmailers, murderers, sewer trash, Pharisees, Bible thumpers, shameless con men, spies, imposters, thugs, fetid carcasses, assassins, butchers, slave drivers, scabs, pigs, crows, which are the priests, um, uh, pygmies, sheep, fools, hermaphrodites, idlers, vultures, shrews, proselytizing neophytes, tyrants, and on and on and on. And 
and he does these amazing diction changes. He has, he has terms that he'll use that are like, I've had to go talk to Italian linguists who are like, oh, yeah, that word, that's like, means like, um, that's a Neapolitan slang for like a, um, you know, what was it, like a, 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 a small goods seller, but it really means you're a drug dealer, <laughs> you know? And, and he'll use those while also quoting, you know, Dante in the same sentence, <laughs> right? And so he, he hits between these like really high and really, really like um, slang terms, which I think for the audience is really empowering because at one point they're, they're being spoken to in their like street language, right? And at the same time, they're being spoken to in this very high intellectual language. So it both lifts them up to feel like they're, you know, they've got a cultural background and speaks to them uh, kind of on their most base level. It's part of his, his theatrics. Um, but it's really amazing paired with this, the same, uh, the bucolic language about all the, the, you know, about the workers and about the gatherings and the parties and the theater, which are all very, very, very positive and, um, and, and, and beautifully uh, written. So it's this real juxtaposition. And, and then the image is the art. Here you get some of these anti-American, American vulture on the wing. You have the, you know, the worker punching the um, cop, I believe, and then you have the, the reign of science in America, which is part of the series with that earlier image of the reign of science in Italy. This is an incredibly powerful image where the slave master is having one slave whipping another slave. And if you notice that the rich uh, slave-owning woman has her view um, hidden so she doesn't have to watch the violence. And here are some of the, um, the major uh, uh, members of the Barry community who are critiqued, kind of goes along with that uh, other list. But you get the mayor, the reverend, the police chief, um, different people that they, you know, they really did not like, Scampini, Angelo Scampini. Some of these might be, I don't know, relatives of yours. <laughs> um, Goretto, Alessandro Goretto, the hated. Um, a lot of these guys also had, um, some of them started off as radicals and kind of transitioned in this part of the, the anger. Can I get the next slide? So the big fight that really shifts everything, and up to this time period, up to, to um, 1906, 1907, the Chronicle is largely a, a small local paper, right? It's, it's, it's in Vermont and New England, right? And, and it's really involved fights in Barrie, right? Um, and, and really standing up for the local workers in Barrie, the immigrants in Barrie. And the big fight ends up coming down around liquor licensing. This is what Emma Goldman and Galliani spoke together on the, on the Opera House stage for. Now, the liquor licensing is a really interesting issue, right? The, um, what happened is we know that all these workers were dying from silicosis. And that left a lot of widows. And the widows would, would often run uh, uh, boarding houses for the workers. They also would often turn their houses into informal bars where they sold alcohol at night to supplant their income because their husband was dead. Um, and once again, you have all these kind of temperance-minded Protestants who do not like what's going on with these Italian-speaking immigrants who are radical and are drinking at, at night, and um, they want to shut it down. At the same time, you also have a kind of capitalist class who wants to control the sale of alcohol. Right? And so their solution is to, to require a license to sell alcohol. This way, you stop the widows from, from turning their houses into bars, and you allow only a limited number, three, four, five people to have bars in town. Um, the city council decides who that is, so it's going to go into the hands of the old boys. And, they're gonna, and the anarchists hate both sides of this. They hate the temperance people for being kind of religious hypocrites, but they hate the guys who are fighting for the liquor licensing, as they call them, camaristi and mafiosi, right? There's these kind of criminals who want to take the money from the hardworking, you know, working class, right? They want liquor to be this unregulated for people to be able to make their own wine and sell their wine from their home um, and not be controlled by the state. But you know, when there's a vote, do you do you support the one side or the other side? It becomes very difficult for them, and they basically advocate for not, as anarchists tend to do, not being involved in the vote. And um, my analysis of it showed that they actually had a really big influence on the way the liquor licensing vote went in Vermont. Um, and in a lot of the towns, most of the towns where there are a large number of subscribers, um, got, uh, went with the way that the anarchists kind of wanted it to uh, versus the average in, in Vermont. And you can kind of get a sense here also of the, the major towns that are connected to the, to the Barry anarchist scene um, in the region. So, the liquor fight gets Galliani 
re they get to the locals really mad at Galliani. They've kind of had it up to here with this gadfly, right? Um, and so they contact uh, Patterson, New Jersey, where he still wanted for the, from five years before from leading the, the strike, um, and get the Patterson officials to come up and arrest Galliani and take him back to Patterson to face trial. Um, and for me, this is the critical moment that changes everything. There's a saying within the kind of the anarchist left um, that we're like the skin of a drum. The harder you hit us, the louder we get. And that's exactly what happens with the Kronika. They take Galliani and arrest him, and they make the Kronika a, a, a major, major paper. Um, and his, his trial and arrest becomes um, this, like a, a major organizing principle. Here you can see um, where most of the subscribers were uh, prior to the arrest and in his defense fund. Can I get the next slide? Uh, and here, okay, so he's a trial. He goes on trial. Uh, here is the, the, the lawyer, the judge. There's a, the first image of Galliani that's actually printed in the Kronika. Um, and then, uh, then his two defense lawyers. Um, and it's really interesting. Up to this time, all these portraitures that appear in the Kronika, largely by Abate, are kind of like these, it's like a heliography and a martyrology of the movement, right? It's, it's the people who died for the movement or the major, major leaders. Galliani appears for the first time in that same canon um, during this trial, right? So it's, it's now lifted him up to being a major player and, and also given him a huge amount of press. There's a defense um, rally in New York City where Emma Goldman and other people come on the stage and, and speak about Galliani's trial and gets a huge amount of national press for him um, and it really changes everything. And here are the subscribers after the trial. It's become a, it's become a national movement, right? Um, and so the way I did my dissertation, the Kronika is a, is a four-page weekly from, printed from 1903 to 1918. Um, it's a, every week on the fourth page is financial information. Every cent sent in as a subscription or as a donation to a strike fund or a legal defense fund or whatever they're raising money for is recorded with a name and a location and the amount of money and often a tiny little note from the worker who sent in his five cents, right? So I transcribed all of that data into spreadsheets, like over 70,000 lines of data. And that allows me to basically map the movement. So I have, I have maps like this that move and show you movement over time. You can talk about all these kind of memes and, and viral ideas and you can see you know, the, the fundraising for the strike start off one spot and then spread throughout the whole network, you know, and then slowly decrease as the strike ends. Um, and so you, you can do this kind of analysis where you can say, look, it concretely, um, can I get the next slide? The, the, the defense really changes everything. And here's a, a, an example of, of, the, um, of the money that came in for the, the different defense stuff. One of the things that's interesting is that um, they didn't have a professional accountant monitoring the movement, uh, moving the paper. And so they ended up um, being a bunch of scandals about where some of the so much money started coming in for the defense fund that years later there are still being fights about where did that money go. Um, and accusations thrown around that someone stole this money or that money or not. And so they're really trying to have a lot of transparency with their finances. And that's why they printed everything in the paper. And it's actually remarkable how successful they were at, at promoting their reliability. Right? You don't necessarily, you know, today you don't think of anarchists as the ones who you, you would trust giving money to, right? Um, necessarily. But for instance, there's a, there's a um, huge earthquake in Calabria. And, and, you know, there's all kinds of national, transnational, you know, international fundraising to help, you know, people sending money through the Red Cross and stuff. In Barry, they all send money through the anarchists. Even in the Anglo speaking community um, send money through the anarchists. Um, because they trust them. They know that their money will, will most likely end up where they are. So when they start getting attacked for not handling the money correctly, it's a huge attack on the, the, trusted, the, the role that newspaper plays within the, the network as not just being a newspaper, right, but being this, a means of moving money across a whole diaspora. Right? Can you get the next slide? And so this leads to the, de the decision to leave Barry. Basically, things, they, they've, they push things so far in Barry that... Um, they start having a lot of fights. A lot of the, the real fights are happening with uh, people who used to be anarchists and have kind of class transitioned, or right, have become successful business owners uh, and no longer are radical. 
and this is where they, call, you know, they start calling them these, these traitors and stuff. And um, there's fights, there's, there's punch outs, there's you know, shootings at picnics by guys, there's you know, by, who are sitting by the mafiosi to try to take out the anarchists. There's Galliani, he's got you know, almost a bounty on his head basically and he has to leave town. Some of his other major lieutenants, um, you know, the, one of them has a barber shop and the guy busts in the barber shop with a gun and there's like a the razor blade knife fight. And, um, and it's all in the paper, it's really, it's really uh, action filled stuff. But um, they decide to leave. And when they decide to leave, and it emphasizes that the paper was not Galliani's. It was a paper that was owned collectively by a movement. That original group that had started the paper raised the money for the paper and bought the printing press. And when they decide to move, you have, you have all these groups sending money in and helping decide where the, um, where the paper should relocate to and, and what should happen. So it's really an interesting conversation um, uh, that shows the kind of like horizontal nature of this, of this movement. And so that finally leads us to the end. And, and uh, the paper decides to leave Barry um, and they move to Lynn, Massachusetts. In Lynn, they do not move to town. They move outside of town to a little farm where they have the printing press and a barn. They do not print the Chronicle Locale news anymore. And they kind of stop shitting where they sleep. Right? They stop getting in fights with the local. And they become a transnational. They get in fights more with the socialists. And they start getting in fights around the Mexican Revolution, around whether anarchists support World War I, um, around organizationalism versus anti-organizationalism. And they become the cronica that is, is remembered by by Paul Average, by Nunzio Perricone, and other historians who write about the fights between the anarchists. And that's really only after he leaves Barry and the Kronika has now become this, Galliani has become a, a kind of iconic figure in the, in the, um, the movement, and, um, and the Kronika has become like the flag bearer for the anti-organizational movement. And trying to understand that, you have to understand that, you know, starting off with Galliani's um, experience in Patterson with the union, his, the year is here where he was battling his head against the corrupt union that was treating the workers shitty. Um, and some of the, the 1910 strike um, was a big one. As you know, there would be all these strikes in Barrie where they would strike to get rid of a grinder that was kicking up dust and killing people. And then, the, you know, they banned the six inch grinder. And so then the bosses come out with an eight inch grinder, right? And so he gets, he ends up being like, look, the union is not the way to, to fight this fight. Um, and that's really his, his, his his disappointment with the union leads to a new level of radicalism. Um, when they move to Lynn, you see how Barry, here's the, the majority of donations are coming in from Barry, and it drops off after he leaves, and donations from Lynn increase a bunch, um, and, it kind of be, and he moves more into Massachusetts and, and the, those factories. Uh, Lynn has the big strike in, um, in 1912, 1913. There's, they get, get much more involved in like, national politics, basically, and it's no longer the local paper that it was in Barry. So that's what I was able to discover um, by reading closely reading the Chronica. There's a lot of details in the dissertation. Uh, I hope that you, if you want to find out more about the concrete nature of all the parties, I list every play that they performed. You know, it's all it's all there. So I um I would I'd love to have you guys read it and talk to me if you need access to it. I can help you get it. But um, that's that's the story. <laughs> And I guess I should uh, take questions, yeah. Um, a box at art school in there. Yeah. At what time? I'm sitting at a table full of boxes, so I'm curious. So, you know, the Bonte. The art school started in the, in the basement of the Goddard Cemetery, uh, sorry, seminary. Uh, when it was not cemetery, seminary, sorry. The, um, in, uh, when it was in Barrie before they moved Goddard and became Goddard College. Um, and I, I think there's a monument over on Blackwell Street, I believe, uh, where Bate had his school at. Um, and what, when was this? What the, the school was started in, the, in the, I think, 1906. I want to say 1906. I don't know the exact date it was started, but it ran for many years after the Chronica left. Um, and Bate continued running for quite a long time. Um, and it was the school design of the drawing school, depending on how you translate it. But it was more than just drawing, because he taught sculpture. He taught, it was, the, the whole curriculum is listed in the, in the dissertation, but they um, had quite a range of, of art classes. And it was, it was um, 
at first it was totally free for the students. And then it becomes a paid gig after the anarchists pull out because they just can't get the community to support it enough. Um, and Abate continues as his, his profession. And the papers was printed in Italian? It was in Italian, yeah. Yeah. In the basement of an tool also. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So I think it moved multiple locations through, mm -hmm. through his tenure. Sorry. Sonic Seminary was formerly called the Haunting Memorial Building, was torn down by the city of Barrie in 1980. And it was a building uh, right next door to the auditorium. And my grandfather taught at the uh, Evening Drawing School in the 1930s. Oh, wow. Very cool. With, with Abate? I don't think with Abate. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure when Abate died. I think it was after the 30s. What? 1949. Yeah, I think we're in the name of the film. Right. Was there any anarchist uh, remnants left here after Chronica? There, there was. So um, in that collection I got from Milan, there were pamphlets printed in Barry in 1913 and 1914. They were being circulated through the Chronica still. So they were still, when the paper left, they, you know, they maintained a relationship with a lot of people still in, in Barry. And there were still donations and, and subscriptions um, from Barry. But radically, as you saw there, that radically decreased um, involvement. But there was still, for sure, uh, an anarchist present for quite a while. And even in, um, so in, in 1919, 1920, when they start doing the Palmer raids and the Red Scare, right? They, um, FBI come to Barry and are interviewing a lot of people. And it's quite hilarious. There's people who have been subscribing to the paper for, you know, 10 years. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'm not an anarchist. I just, I just like to read the paper, you know? <laughs> and then there's some guys who are like, oh, you know, to the FBI, like, oh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an anarchist, you know? And um, they're quite impressively not shying away from it. But a lot of people kind of, I just read it. I, I subscribe to lots of papers. Um, but yeah, and, and you know, so you know, to go back to the, the militancy that emerges after Barry, after, when, the, when the Palmer raids happen, that's when the Gallianisti really start. They, they do the, the first mail bombings, where they send bombs in the mail to a lot of judges. And they, they blow up the house of, of Judge Thayer, who is the judge who condemned Sokka and Vanzetti to death. They blow up the house of Attorney General Palmer. Um, so they really start, uh, 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 but it's all again Palmer's raiding the immigrant community, sh deporting all these radicals and stuff. So it's it's seen as an attentat. It's not seen as a, as a terrorism. If the papers in Italian are all the anarchists Italian, did they reach out to other nationalities? I mean, there is a very multi-ethnic community. It always has. Been. Yeah, and so like you said, there's lots of rallies with the Spanish and, and other groups that they're working with, but they kind of let them have their own papers. Um, and it's a really interesting question because for, for me and for like a lot of say, American scholars, we see them as very transnational because, you know, the, I, I was able to map over 2,500 locations that the paper was subscribed to um, across North America, but also in Latin America and in Europe and in in Australia. Um, so it's transnational. That's for me, transnational. When I went and talked about this in uh, Switzerland, I had someone object to say it's not transnational, they're only speaking in Italian. Because Europeans, nation is about language more than borders, right? So it's really, um, so there's cross-national, what we would call cross-national between different linguistic groups. And they do make out a lot of efforts, but there's a lot of translation. And you gotta remember, a lot of these, a lot of these guys spoke a lot of languages. Um, and, and it's one of those things, the Chronicle only had a, around 5,000, 3,000 to 5,000 maybe uh, printing every issue. But a lot of those are being, uh, purchased by different workers groups, so they're going to reading rooms. So you can't really understand how many people were reading it based by the number of newspapers that were being printed. Um, and then there's a lot of like, so the pamphlet published in 1913 in Barry with, in Italian, which was about, was um, Max Netlau's uh, Solidarity in the Workers' Struggle, which was originally written in German, and then it was translated into Spanish, Argentina, and then it was translated into Italian and published in, in Barry. So like, you know, it's, there's a lot of, of translation. Also, all the woodblock engravings are constantly being reprinted. So one of the things I would love to do is actually try to map the, the reprinting networks and be able to follow some of the images as they move through different newspapers. Um, they're very promiscuous with their material. They don't care about copyright. Was there any relationship between the anarchists and the law? Oh, very much so. So this Patterson group, the Right to Existence group, is one of the founders of the IWW. And they had a rally in Patterson that, that found the movement. Uh, 
when it happens, the Kronika is skeptical of it. We'll see if these guys are really radical union or just another, you know, AFL. Um, and 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 they supported it. They um, they supported the big strike in Lynn and in Patterson. Uh, Galliani helped organize, um, bringing the children out of uh, of the big out of Lynn, and it brought a bunch of the children up to Barry um, to to support support them. Right? Maybe even this hall. I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, they're 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 continuing to be um, very much involved. Any other questions? Yeah. Did the roadblocks wind up anywhere? Did the roadblocks go to that? I wish I could find a roadblock. An original Avate roadblock would be like gold, right? Um, yeah, I don't know what, what happened to any of them. One of the neat things though is if you look at those Avate woodblocks, they look very sketched, right? But if you understand woodblock manufactured. The, all the ink is it, it's very, very intentional. So the Italians have this idea of um, spettatura, right? Of making a really hard art look really, really easy, right? And so this is a time period in which, you know, a woodblock engraving is competing with photo and gravure and the beginning of photography being able to be printed, right? And so this whole debate, do you try to compete with photography for, for similitude? Do you try to have your image look real? And Abate clearly, says, no, I want you to know that this was made by a human hand, right? And so the, the sketch nature of it is, 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 a, is a piece of, of um, masterwork and is and incredibly intentional. And when the line looks like it was outside of the, outside of the line, like that was, he carved that outside part, you know what I mean, specifically to make it clear that he's not trying to look like a photograph. like this. Um, we never served coffee, but there is coffee if you want it on the way out. And um, those of you who bid on the option, um, if you check with me um, at the table, we can settle everything up.